Just to show you that I think I know you, that's Mary Caruso and Maria Petty and Tom Kuhn and Anthony Della Rosa and Craig, Chris McTig, McTee, okay, Mary McManus, Neil Blotty, Paul Sharkey, Jerry Nellis, and Rich Reitberger. How do you do that? That's what you're supposed to be able to do. That's what I've done for 48 years. When Herman Estrin died on May 7, 1999, he was remembered fondly by colleagues and friends. NJIT President Sol K. Fenster said of Estrin, quote, By a wide margin, he was the most asked for professor whenever I visited alumni groups through the nation and the world. Doc taught students to have an appreciation for arts, humanities, and communications, and to have a regard for their fellow human beings. He was a wonderful teacher and friend to students. Doc Estrin came to NJIT in 1946, then the newer College of Engineering, charged with the task of introducing English teachings into an engineering curriculum. Approach English as you would any task. Work as hard at it as you need to become proficient. English is governed by rules and laws, as are all technical studies. Learn and use them. This was some of the advice Estrin garnered from his former students and offered to the incoming freshmen of the newer College of Engineering. Estrin was a strong believer that the university student be an extremely well-rounded individual and encouraged students to join and participate in as many extracurricular activities as they could and interact with their fellow classmates. I have emphasized, Estrin once wrote, the conception of the educational process as the accomplishment of learning through directed living and the conception of the college as a miniature community in which students learn to live the civilized life of today by actual participation in social processes. Throughout his over 50-year tenure at NJIT, Doc Estrin was advisor to over 16 student publications and press associations. Professor Robert E. Lynch, an associate of Herman's in the Humanities Department, described him as a student social advisor who would often plan activities for students that would help them to improve their speech, teach them how to dress, and even how to secure dates to the school dance. His passion, however, lie in a love of writing, and even more so in the teaching of writing to his students. He made the study of writing exciting by appealing to the topics that his students cared about. He once wrote, I have found that freshman students write well on those topics in which they are interested. If you listen to freshmen's conversations in the corridors, in the cafeterias, or in the counseling situations, they ask these questions. How can I emancipate myself from my parents? Why do teenagers take drugs? What are the sex mores of teenagers? These and similar questions are asked throughout the country and are based on the developmental tasks of youth. Estrin thought there was a writer hiding inside almost every engineer, and that in allowing the student to discover his or her own voice would enrich their lives in a positive way. Estrin discussed the role of the professor as someone that must, quote, help the student to shape their thoughts into written words. He wrote, Open the students' minds to the power, use, and beauty of language, and show them the unending world of literature. The teacher of composition must instill in students an enjoyment of reading, a respect for, and an appreciation of the written word, and a feeling that their adolescent lives have been enriched and matured by their experiences in English. Estrin once told a reporter, Basically, engineers are interested in things, not words. But they have native intelligence. And if you light sparks underneath them, you can make them good writers. He did this with countless students. Albert Smith, a graduate of the class of 1951, said of Estrin, I think what he tried to do was expand everybody's mind. Engineers tend to be introspective and focused on what they do. They are basically naive to what's happening in the world, especially at 18 or 19, and I think he tried to give them a window on social issues. Estrin did just that, both in his teaching and in his work in extracurricular activities. He earned his doctorate from Columbia University in Student Personnel Administration in Higher Education and was absolutely committed to his students. He wrote, As engineering educators, we realize that engineering education should aim to train the student not only as a technical man, but also as a citizen and as a social human being. Throughout his four years, an engineer's education is narrow and restricted. However, it should be broader and more fundamental, and should include liberal culture with the technical subjects. 
A well-developed program of extracurricular activities can infuse the engineering curriculum with this liberal culture and can prepare the student for the role that he will play in his community and professional life. One of the ways Herman devoted himself to this cause was as advisor to the various student publications at NGIT. Estrin saw his role as advisor of the Vector, Orbit, and Nucleus, and countless other publications as a voice of encouragement, aimed, in his own words, to, quote, foster cooperation between the faculty and the student body, and to promote a higher standard of collegiate journalism by the application of journalistic principles and ethics. These goals are achieved through the efforts and cooperation of the advisor. College ed editors come and go, but the advisor remains to provide a continuum of philosophy and policy of the newspaper, and to inculcate and perpetuate a love of learning, a seeking for knowledge, and the courage to use this knowledge for the improvement of the college community. The Vector, the student newspaper since 1924, previously titled The Technician, saw itself blossom under the advisement of Doc Estrin. Outside the office of the Vector headquarters is a plaque that hangs in memory of Herman. Herman took his role as advisor quite seriously and devoted a significant amount of time to ensuring the success of the student newspaper, even publishing multiple books and a number of articles on collegiate journalism and winning eight awards for furthering college journalism education. While faculty advisor to the paper, he urged the Vector's editors to render those services necessary to produce a superior paper, which included to present accurate news to those who are actively interested in the school, the students, faculty, administration, parents, and alumni, to express student opinion and thought, to unify the ideals and objectives of the school, to try to promote an esprit de corps within the school, to encourage and promote worthy college activities, to serve as an outlet for the creativity of students as writers, photographers, artists, and cartoonists, to promote scholarship and leadership, to support the traditions of the school, to record a permanent history of the school, and to uphold and demonstrate the best forms of and the highest ideals of journalism. Doc Estrin was also faculty advisor of the student yearbook, The Nucleus, and the college magazine, The Orbit. In these various roles, Herman took very seriously the idea of freedom of speech in student publications. He once wrote that as an advisor of student publications, he need not participate in the college's publication, believing that the paper be left entirely in the hands of the students. Quote, he will, on request, give helpful hints and suggestions, but for the most part, the paper is a student project. Herman felt so strongly on this issue that he even edited and published a book on college press censorship and dedicated it to the staff of the Vector. There were times, however, when the boundaries were crossed. The grossest example occurring in 1969 when an issue of the Orbit printed what Robert W. Van Houten, the current president of the college, called a crude racist piece of irresponsible journalism, an extremely offensive photo and accompanying caption. It was reprinted in the Rutgers Newark Observer along with an apology from the Newark College of Engineering's Publication Council. In the apology, the school apologized for the grossly offensive slur. Unfortunately, Estrin had not reviewed the magazine before publication and had to issue an apology along with the college and dean of students. Consequently, the orbit was suspended and the editorial staffs of all other publications were asked to review their current policies. As a whole, however, Estrin's positive impact on the student body was undeniable. Boxes of Estrin's old things are filled with letters from former students and professionals, all gushing with well wishes and updates about their lives, reminding him of the deep impact he had on them. Countless individuals attribute their professional success to Estrin's guidance during their time at NGIT. Albert Smith, who we mentioned earlier, met Estrin on a bus home and described the meeting later in 1990 for NGIT magazine. Albert was sitting in his seat reading over an issue of The Technician when a stranger in the next seat asked him how he liked the publication. Smith said curtly, I don't. To which the stranger, who was of course her and Estrin, replied, Then why don't you come and work for it to make it better? Smith did just this, later becoming editor of the newspaper and also partnered with Estrin to develop other NJIT publications. 
After graduate, graduating with a career in engineering, Smith later became an editor at McGraw-Hill, writing articles on construction and engineering, and eventually going on to become an executive vice president and senior consultant of one of the largest international public relations firms in the world. Surrounding Estrin were individuals whose experiences were similar to that of Albert Smith. Herman was quick to remind people when the stereotype was broken of the engineer that cannot write. He frequently encouraged his students to publish their original writings both in the school paper and magazine. And in 1983, Estrin compiled a collection of poetry written by NJIT students titled Poetic Engineers. The collection included poems such as Belfast and Other Tourist Traps, written by Bruce A. Bennett, a mechanical engineer who went on to win first prize in the New Jersey Student Poetry Competition and also co-edited the book with Estrin. An article in the New York Times said of Herman, quote, that his reward for teaching is the knowledge that he has enriched his students' lives. But it would be in Estrin's other major project, his literary hall of fame, that he sought to expand the knowledge of individuals beyond the borders of the classroom. He established the New Jersey Literary Hall of Fame in 1976, seeking to recognize the prolific authors in the state of New Jersey that had had a marked impact on the world of literature and writing. In this endeavor, Estrin sought to disprove another commonly held misbelief. He was tired of individuals saying to him, I didn't know he or she was from New Jersey. He told a New York Times reporter that he found this type of ignorance about his home state deplorable and spearheaded a one-man mission to change people's minds about New Jersey's literary history. The New Jersey Literary Hall of Fame still exists today in a series of glass cases inside Cupfrey and Hall at NJIT. It once held the drawings and photographs of writers, along with brief biographies and copies of their books. But now, however, it retains a different purpose. It houses the mementos and artifacts that celebrated Estrin's impact at NJIT. Awards, photographs, plaques, books, papers, and other tokens. Together they represent just a marginal amount of Estrin's professional experiences while teaching at NJIT. Over his lifetime, Estrin published over 300 articles and 9 books. He is especially well thought of in the field of technical communication, in which he is regarded by many as single-handedly bringing the field to the attention of the National Council of Teachers of English, and the Modern Language Association. Former Executive Director of the Journal of Technical Writing and Communication, David Carson, described Estrin as having, quote, more influence than any other person. He had incredible energy. Estrin's list of honors is long and impressive, even including a silver medal from the Mayor of Paris for teaching chemical engineering students at the University of Paris. But the true mark of Estrin's life lies with his students, who still bring up his name fondly at alumni events. He retired in 1981, but continued to walk the halls of NGIT, and was an active member of the college almost until the end of his life. On May 7, 1999, Estrin passed away at the age of 83. In lieu of flowers, memorial contributions were asked to be made to the scholarship fund that bears his name. In this way, Estrin could continue to make an impact in the lives of the students of whom he loved so dearly. In fact, one time, the, um, uh, the Star Ledger wanted to interview me, and I said, sorry, I have a tech writing class. And my goal, every class I ever met, none of you are my, my former students, but you know that for years, I would meet 30, 40, 50 students and got to know them by name by the end of the class. And one interesting thing, uh, this is name identification, which all of you could use. Uh, Maria was talking to me about association of names, remember? And this is what you do. You learn how to associate your names, and they stay with you for the, I hate to say it, for the rest of the days of your life. And I've known about, you're not going to believe it, 25,000 students in 48 years.